Assalamualaikum and hello everyone. Welcome to this channel by me, Mok. You're watching a video series about the human anatomy according to its bodily system. Today, we are going to talk about the respiratory system, all the essentials that you need to know in basic medical science. The references and credits for today's video goes to The Clinical Anatomy by Richard Snell, Illustrated Anatomy by Glenn Bastian, and Complete Anatomy by 3D4 Medical. Before we go into all the details, let's look a bit at the overview of all the things that we are going to learn in respiratory system. These topics include the components of the respiratory system and others from different system but are clinically relevant. We are going to learn about the airway, the pleura, respiratory muscles, osteology of thorax, the blood supply, innervation, and surface anatomy. And let's leave some checkbox to track our progress. So let's begin. Our first component is our airway. They are essentially the structure which air passes through. This is our airway from the anterior and lateral views. We can divide our airway into the upper and the lower airway. Upper airway denotes everything which are above the trachea and lower airway starting with the trachea and all the structures below it. The components of the upper airway starts with our nose, nasal cavity, our pharynx and larynx, and the lower airway are made up of the trachea, bronchi, bronchiole, and the alveoli. These are the close-up view of our upper airway. When air comes into our system, it will first encounter our nose. So our nose it is made up of cartilages and fibrofatty tissue. We have a pair of lateral nasal cartilage and major ala cartilage, which make up for the hard part of our nose and a fibro fatty tissue for the softer part. And the incoming air will enter our nose through the nasal vestibule. And it is lined by the hairs called vibrissae, which removes the coarse particles from the incoming air. Then it will enter our nasal cavity. There are about three pairs of concave or terminates lining each lateral side. And from below, we have the inferior nasal concave. The tears from our eyes will drain through the lacrimal duct and it is emptied through the inferior meatus. Next, we have the middle and superior nasal concave. The scroll-like elevations formed by our concave increases the surface area of our respiratory membrane which essentially helps to condition the incoming air. Our nasal cavity is lined by the pseudostratified columnar epithelium, and closely below this basement membrane are numerous blood capillaries, so the heat in our blood vessels radiates through and warms the incoming air. Among others, the goblet cells help to moisten the air and trap dust particles, which then will be swept into the pharynx by the cilia. Our nasal cavity is also extended into paranasal sinuses which essentially are air-filled spaces and we have four pairs of them, the frontal, ethmoidal, maxillary and sphenoidal sinuses, uh, each named according to its respective skull bones. Apart from respiration, the respiratory system also helps us with vocalizations, so these paranasal sinuses also serve as the resonant chambers for vocalizations. Air entering our nasal cavity will pass through the nasal cavity into the pharynx through the cone or also known as the internal nares. It connects our nasal cavities with the nasopharynx which is the superior portion of our pharynx and we can divide our pharynx into three namely the nasopharynx, oropharynx and laryngopharynx. Other structures uh, related to the pharynx are the eustachian tube which connects the middle ear with the nasopharynx, and just in close proximity to it, we have the pharyngeal tonsil. In oropharynx, there is the palatinevula, palatoglossal arch, and palatopharyngeal arch. However, these structures are actually more important to be highlighted in gastrointestinal system, because the pharynx is probably the only component which is shared between the respiratory and gastrointestinal system. So the muscles of the pharynx are important in the swallowing process, so we will highlight them in details in gastrointestinal system. Essentially, the pharynx acts only as a passage for air between our nasal cavities and the larynx, 
which is our voice box. From oropharynx, it passes the foot bolus into the esophagus. The larynx is a very complex organ made up of multiple pieces of cartilages, ligaments and muscles. And the most prominent is the thyroid cartilage which forms the Adam apple. Just below it is the cricoid cartilage and the arytenoid cartilage plays the biggest role among the other cartilages in altering the voices because the muscles controlling the cord, as we will see, are attached to it. And just above it, there is a pair of small cartilage called the corniculate cartilage. In between pharynx and larynx, there is the epiglottis, which act as a cover to the opening of our larynx, so it will prevent any food from entering through here. The few ligaments here are the median and lateral thyrohyoid ligament, which is between the thyroid cartilage and the hyoid bone. Between the hyoid bone and epiglottis, there is the hyoepiglottic ligament. And between the thyroid and cricoid, there are median and lateral cricothyroid cartilage. And lastly, between the trachea and the cricoid, there is cricothracheal cartilage. From superior view, we can see thin elastic ligaments within the vocal folds that will vibrate and produce sound when air is directed to it. And just above it, there is a pair of vestibular ligament. Mucosa fold over this ligament forms the false vocal cord. We can divide the laryngeal muscles into intrinsic and extrinsic muscles. The intrinsic muscles can be further divided into those which control the size of the laryngeal inlet and those which alters the vocal cords. The oblique arytenoid muscle and thyroepiglottic muscle controls the laryngeal inlet. Uh, the first one narrows the inlet whereas the thyroepiglottic will widen the inlet. Thyroarytenoid is also known as the vocalis muscle. It relaxes uh, the vocal cord. And transverse arytenoid approximate the arytenoid cartilage. And the posterior arytenoid will abduct the cord. And from the lateral view, we can see the cricothyroid muscles, uh, which tense the cord, and lateral arytenoid, which will adduct the cord. As you can see, there are many muscles that hinges on the arytenoid cartilage, and all of them involved in vocalization, among others. The picture on the left also hit the thyroid cartilage, so you can also see the vocalis muscle here. All intrinsic laryngeal muscles are innervated by the recurrent laryngeal nerve, which is a branch of the vagus nerve, except the cricothyroid, which is innervated by external laryngeal nerve. The extrinsic laryngeal muscles are located on the anterior side of our body. It also can be divided into two groups, those which elevate the larynx and those which depress the larynx. The elevators are the digastric muscle, stylohyoid, mylohyoid, and geniohyoid, which is located just above the mylohyoid. And the depressors are the sternohyoid, omohyoid, sternothyroid, and thyrohyoid muscles. Most of these muscles are named according to its origin and insertion, likewise for the ligaments that we uh, learned previously. And a lot of them are attached to the hyoid bone, which is connected to the thyroid cartilage via the median and lateral thyrohyoid ligament we have seen. Next, we have the lower airway. Our trachea is about 10 cm in length and lined by the ciliated pseudostratified epithelium. And there are many mucus secreting goblet cells as well. And this structure is supported by 20 pieces of C shaped hyaline cartilage that helps to keep the space in this tube open. And the trachea will branch into primary bronchus, which goes into each lung. They are the right main bronchus and left main bronchus. The primary bronchi then branches into smaller secondary bronchi, also known as the lobar bronchi, because these bronchi goes into the lung according to its lobe. For the right lung, we have three lobes, so the bronchi are the superior, middle, and inferior lobar bronchi, and for the left lung, we only have the superior and inferior lobar bronchi. The last type of bronchi is the tertiary bronchi, uh, 
These are also known as the segmental bronchi because it enters the lung into its specified bronchopulmonary segment, which is also the basic functional unit of the lung. From the superior lobe, there are three branches into the bronchopulmonary segments, which are the apical, anterior, and posterior segmental bronchi. The medial lobe has only two, which are the medial and lateral. The inferior has five. The first branch is known as the superior segmental bronchus. Others have basal to its name because it is near towards the lung base and not to be confused with other lung segment. They are the medial, anterior, posterior and lateral basal segmental bronchi. And the left superior lobar bronchi gives out to four branches, which are the apical posterior, anterior, superior lingula and inferior lingula segmental bronchi. The inferior lumbar bronchi gives out to five, just as the right lung. The first branch is also called the superior segmental bronchus, and the others also have the basal to its name. So we have medial basal, anterior basal, posterior basal, and lateral basal segmental bronchi. The tertiary bronchi branches into a very small tube called the bronchioles, which roughly just about 5 mm in length. And histologically, we can further divide our bronchioles into three. The first one, we call them just bronchioles, and next, the terminal bronchioles and the respiratory bronchioles. And what differs them are the cellular components. The first one, the just bronchioles essentially are lined by ciliated columnar epithelium and mucus secreting goblet cells, while the terminal bronchioles are similar to it except that it is lacking in goblet cells. The terminal bronchioles eventually branches into a more smaller microscopic branch which are called the respiratory bronchioles. It is called the respiratory bronchioles because from this part onwards where the respiratory portion of our airways begins. And unlike others, these are lined by the ciliated cuboidal cells instead of columna, and as it goes deeper, it will become the squamous cells. The respiratory bronchioles becomes a 2 to 11 alveolar ducts which have no cuboidal cells in between the alveoli, and these later will become alveolar sacs. Unlike a tube, these are expanded regions uh, full of alveoli. And none of the other airway components before respiratory bronchial can carry gas exchange. So they simply are called the conducting portion of our airway. They only provide the passage for the air to reach the respiratory portion. And this conducting portion ends at the terminal bronchial, hence the name terminal and the rest of the airway component are called the respiratory portion. The air conditioning, as you may see, not only happens in our nasal cavity, but is carried throughout the airway. So it makes sure that the air is moist and warm so that it would not dry the delicate membrane of the alveoli. And the cilia at the top will sweep all the air impurities all the way to our pharynx to be swallowed or expectorated. The site where gas exchange occur is called the alveolus, which is a sac-like structure made up of two types of cells. The first one is squamous epithelial cells, also known as the alveolar type 1, and the other is the septal cells, which is also known as alveolar type 2. And squamous cells accounts for 97% of the cells, while the septal cells just intersperse in between them. Gas exchange occurs mainly across type 1, whereas type 2 helps to secrete a substance called surfactant, which it reduces the surface tension of the lung, hence will reduce the force required to inflate the lungs during inspiration. And while in expiration, this surfactant prevents the alveoli from collapsing. And there are also Alveolar macrophages, also known as the dust cells within the layers of the surfactant, which will phagocytize any foreign microorganisms. So those are all the components of airway to its microscopic level, but grossly our lungs looks like a packed cone-shaped organ, 
each separated in the middle by the mediastinum, and both are sitting on our diaphragm. It has three surfaces, the lateral, medial, and diaphragmatic. Let's look first at the lateral surface of our lung. The first thing you may notice is our right lung has two fissures which are oblique and horizontal, whereas the left lung has only one. So these divides the right and left lung into three and two lobes respectively. And unlike the left lung, the right lung has the middle lobe. And other differences are the left lung also has a thin like projection from its inferior lobe, which is called the lingula. It also has a curve at its medial border due to the cardiac depression. This is called the cardiac notch. And our right lung is also shorter and heavier compared to the left lung. Next, we look at the medial surface of the lung. The area where major vessels enters into the lung is called the hilus, and the left lung has a wide concave area, which is occupied by the uh, heart. This is called the cardiac depression. And there are also other grooves, uh, for example, for the aortic arch, for the thoracic aorta or descending aorta, and esophagus just right next to it. And a smaller groove just above the aortic arch is for the left subclavian artery. There is also the diaphragmatic surface seen here. Likewise, the right lung also has some similar structures uh, with exceptions. For example, the cardiac depression here is less uh, prominent as the heart sits on the left side of our body. There is also depression caused by the isthmus and superior vena cava. The groove for subclavian artery and the esophagus are also present here at about just the same location. And that marks the end for the lengthy airway component. Next is the pleura, which essentially are the coverings for our lung. It can be divided into the visceral and parietal pleura. Visceral is the inner layer overlying our lung parenchyma, whereas parietal is the outer layer attached to the thoracic wall. And in between, there is the pleural cavity containing about roughly 5 ml of pleural fluid. And this fluid acts as lubricants. It reduces the friction between our alternately expanding and shrinking lung with the parietal pleura. The third component is our respiratory muscles. It can be divided into inspiratory and expiratory component. So there are a lot of respiratory muscles, but not all are always in use. And there are two reasons to this. Firstly, because inspiratory process is an active process, unlike expiratory, which is passive. So expiratory is mainly passive because the shrinking of the lung are mainly due to the recoil of the lung elastic fibers and inward pull due to the surface tension provided by the lung surfactant. Thus, the other expiratory muscles are only used during labored breathing in event where some disease may impede the outflow of air out of the lung. And likewise, among inspiratory muscles, the only ones used during normal breathing are only the diaphragm and the external intercostals, whereas the other muscles are used during labored breathing. The diaphragm increases the vertical dimensions of the thoracic cavity, while the intercostal increases the anterior-posterior dimension of our thoracic cavity. And other inspiratory muscles generally elevate or pull the ribs up, whereas the expiratory muscles will depress or pull the rib downwards to make the thoracic cavity volume smaller. And the most important inspiratory muscle is the diaphragm. It forms a dome shape when it relaxes and flattens when it contracts. There are three types of ligament to our diaphragm. The first one in the median is the median arcuate ligament. And just lateral to it are a pair of medial arcuate ligament. And the outermost and the longest are the lateral arcuate ligament. The superior part of the diaphragm, this whitish area here, is the central tendon. And inferiorly, the right cruise attached to the L1, L2, and LT vertebrae, whereas the left cruise attach only to the L1 and L2. And there are three famous openings which uh, where structure passes through. At 
eighth thoracic vertebrae, the inferior vena cava and the right phrenic nerve pass here. At 10th thoracic vertebrae, the esophagus and the pair of vagus nerve, and just below the median arcuate ligament. At around 12th thoracic vertebrae, we have the thoracic aorta becoming the abdominal aorta. And the other two less famous uh, structures are the medial arcuate ligament, where the pair of psoas muscles and sympathetic trunk uh, passes through. The only structure left is the left phrenic nerve, which lonely appears through here. The phrenic nerve innervates the diaphragm. Next is the intercostal muscles, both internal and external. And to remember their function, just remember that both of them perform the opposite to the initials of their name. For example, internal for expiratory and external for inspiratory. And the external muscles are directed towards the center, whereas the internal are directed outwards. Uh, both of these structures are innervated by the intercostal nerves. Next is sternocleidomastoid, which is innervated by accessory nerve or cranial nerve 11, and scalene muscles by the cervical spinal nerves. As the name implies, sternocleidomastoid originated from sterno for sternum, and cleido, which means the clavicle. It inserted to the mastoid process of the temporal bone. And these scalenes originated from the first and second ribs, and it will insert into the transverse process of the cervical 2 to cervical 6. Other than lifting the rib upwards during labored breathing, the sternocleidomastoid also performs lateral flexion of the head due to its clavicular origin, and heat rotation due to its sternal origin. The other muscles are the serratus posterior. The superior portion is innervated by the thoracic nerves and it pulls the rib upwards, hence inspiratory action during labored breathing. While the serratus posterior inferior is also innervated by the, low, by the thoracic nerves but at the lower side and it involves in expiration because it pulls the ribs downwards. Lastly, we have the abdominal muscles, which are made up of four layers. The outermost is the external oblique, followed by the internal oblique, just right below it. Then there is the rectus abdominis, famously known as the six packs, and the innermost are called the transverse abdominis. Since all of them are attached, uh, though differently, to the thoracic wall, all of them assist in pulling the rib downwards, you can feel the action of these muscles by putting your hand on your stomach and try to do a forceful expiration. You'll notice that you will bend forwards as your abdominal muscles pull your ribs down. Other than respiratory function, the external also helps to rotate the trunk to the opposite side, whereas the internal oblique rotates the trunk on the same side. All of these muscles are innervated by the lower intercostal nerves and subcostal nerves. That is all for this video. We will continue with the rest at part 2. If this video proves useful, smash the like button and share them with friends and family. Don't forget to subscribe for future videos. Thank you for watching. Bye bye.